Hi there, this is Reading Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and this is the afterword. I couldn't finish this series without commenting on the afterword. Written in 1984, ten years after the book's publication, it is here that we learn a couple of very important things. One of them is the fate of the book, and the other one is the fate of Chris. The afterword begins with a discussion of the ancient Greek view of time. So we, in the modern view of time, we, we see the future, we're facing toward the future. But the Greeks saw the future, they would face backward, let's just say, and they're looking at the past recede, and that actually makes a lot more sense when you think about it, because how can you determine the future? The train of quality goes forward on the track, propelled by quality, but informed by that past, by those boxcars. One of the most notable facts about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which a lot of people know, is how many times it was rejected. It was rejected over 120 times, I think 121, he says. But one lone publisher, William Morrow, and one particular individual, whose name I forget, who really um, saw the value of this book, um, thought it might become a great book, and in fact it did. So what makes this book so great? In this afterward, Piersig uses a Swedish word. You know, Piersig is half Swedish, his mother is. And that word is kulturbearer, to describe the phenomenon, which means, of course, culture bearer. A culture bearing book, like a mule, bears the culture on its back. No one should sit down to write one deliberately. Culture-bearing books occur almost accidentally, like a sudden change in the stock market. There are books of high quality that are a part of the culture, but that's not the same. They are a part of it. They aren't carrying it anywhere. They may talk about insanity sympathetically, for example, because it's the standard cultural attitude, but they don't carry any suggestion that insanity might be something other than sickness or degeneracy, meaning it's a book that harkens into what what is already brewing, let's just say, in the collective unconscious, uh, collective unconscious, and it articulates it, promotes it, or even triggers a paradigm shift. And generally, the writer is some kind of visionary, which prompts the question, so just what is insanity? The philosophy in this book was laid out by someone who is supposedly insane and refined by someone who was no longer insane. But the fact of the matter is the visionary, it's the person who came up with the philosophy was this supposed insane one. So look back at history, at visionaries. Would you not say that they too could be construed as insane, or at the very least went through a period of insanity in which they heard voices and saw visions? The people who are, you know, referred to, referred to in this regard the most, I guess you would say, is Christ and Buddha. But anyone who's created a serious paradigm shift has probably gone through some stage of being extremely unsettled. Carl Jung is a good example of that. And I don't think that what Piercig went through, you know, is uncommon in that regard. And, and to view it as insanity, of course, uh, is kind of insane in a way. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things to really think about in terms of what ins insanity is about. And you're also going to see this discussed in the next book in Lila. It's going to be a big part of that. So I think Piercig, uh, without doing this in an egoistic way, maybe even you know, by the grace of whatever it is in the universe, believed he was a visionary. And you can hear this in his voice when he talks about the metaphysics of quality um, in, the, in the Lila interview. There's two very good interviews uh, with Piercing online. One is when Zam came out, and the other one is when Lila came out, and I'll link to them both. But I don't think it's really until now, until we're dealing with how the information age is laying bare the deficits of subject-object metaphysics in full of a hard materialistic viewpoint that Piercing's work can truly fulfill its potential as a culture bearer. Emerging from all around us now are thinkers whose theories and writings parallel the core of Piercing's philosophy. Um, this is, of course, you know, uh, 50 years later. So in this corner, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, you know, Peterson, Jonathan Peugeot and, and Jordan Peterson say that science is nested in religion and not the other way around. And <clears throat> Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master and the Emissary, is a direct expression of this concept. 
The right hemisphere sees the integrated whole. The left hemisphere uses the analytic knife to concentrate on parts. The left hemisphere, in, in McGillicrist's theory, helps the right. It's an emissary to the master, and the master is the, the viewpoint of the right hemisphere that sees the totality, uh, sees quality. On rebel wisdom, a lot of these thinkers are kind of people who have this, this viewpoint that rationality is a servant, is subservient to this bigger, greater thing. Um, Ken Wilber's work is being revitalized, and we can see within this context the wisdom of transcending and including. What you get is, is you get on the quality track, and, um, and that is an evolutionary process where you would have to use what's in the boxcars to make the, the next thing. Not so much evolution in the sense that scientific ideas get better, but that the whole totality of being as a, on the planet evolves. And that has to be an evolutionary perspective, which is, of course, the evolutionary perspective, I think, fits in a lot better with Piercing's viewpoint than the scientific viewpoint. Ken Wilber um, has articulated the problems with the green level, with the postmodern level. With Piercing uh, would characterize this green level as a cultural immune system. We're going to talk about that in Lila, which is a rigid way of thinking that won't accept any quality updates, that only operates with the material within its confines. And um, I've mentioned before the behavioral biologist Robert Sapolsky, and his, if you read his book, you're going to see that same thing, that back and forth dynamic in which, in which environment and agent are continually influencing each other, when you can't really say there's an environment and then there's nurture and nature because they are so enmeshed, they're so intertwined, they're so dynamic. And dynamical systems theory um, which, by the way, was, partial, was, was partially articulated by Poincaré, and you can really understand that when, when you um, look at, at the way that Poincaré's understanding of reality has been defined in this book. It seems much more in line with how things really work rather than a subject-object viewpoint. Culture-bearing books challenge cultural value assumptions and often do so at a time when the culture is changing in favor of their challenge. The success of Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance seems the result of this culture-bearing phenomenon. The involuntary shock treatment described here is against the law today. It's a violation of human liberty. The culture has changed. But this, you know, this, while important, reevaluation of mental illness and not forcing people into treatment, uh, yeah, that, that, is, that is part of the importance of this book, you know, how that it was partially influential for that. But that's only a shade of the real culture-bearing importance of this book. The other really important element um, is that what was considered success was material and very measurable on those terms. And as the century entered the second half, something became more valuable to people, and that was freedom. But this freedom, okay, so, so he makes a distinction between the you know, material success and this freedom that, that the hippies, let's just say, want. And that desire for freedom is really a reaction against their parents, and that wasn't solution. In fact, that pursuit of freedom is actually de uh, degenerate. Too free is, is an alternative to too rigid. There are, they're just two sides of the same coin. This book offers another more serious alternative to material success. It's not so much an alternative as an expansion of the meaning of success to something larger than just getting a good job and staying out of trouble and also something larger than mere freedom. It gives a positive goal to work toward that does not confine. Think of the, well, the cultural immune system, you know, toward and does not confine. That is the main reason for the book's success, I think. The whole culture happened to be looking for exactly what this book has to offer. And, that's, and that is the sense in which it is, it is a culture bear. And what I think he means by that positive goal is, is you're, you're going towards quality the good. It doesn't matter what you do just so long as it has quality. So you can see in a, in a bit of an interesting way that there's a, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a set thing which is quality, but there's also a dynamism around it, which is it doesn't matter how that quality manifests just so long as it manifests in a quality way. So you, you have that as freedom in there, not the freedom of just reacting to whatever you think uh, is, is oppressing you. So it's a very different kind of freedom. It's a freedom to choose things based on quality, not on any, and this is the rigidity, not on any set standard. So you see how Persig's 
notion of a goal of a positive goal of going towards a positive goal isn't towards material success in the sense of the um, the 50s or towards freedom in this in the sense of the 60s it's much more um, it's much more important his characterization much more important much more useful than that something that you can actually transfer to any time in history let's just say but it is at this time that that culture bearing nature of this book I believe is more important than even back in the in that transitional time of the 60s and maybe Pearson has a sense of this since he was still alive during the explosion of, of digital information he was, this, he was he was a part you know he he the information age happens right around you know the time we're talking about in the book a little earlier I guess and that's that it teaches us how to live well and in that sense it expands the meaning of success it offers a metaphysical understanding of reality that can make sense of this explosion of digital objects by teaching us to see quality rather than the objects so that we can begin to discern what is good out of all this confusing combinatorially explosive mess of objects of information and this is especially important since we can no longer discern what's true at least not in the logical rational sense again because there's too much information you can you can manufacture a logical truth uh, any way you want pretty much because there's so much there to work with remember what he said you know this is the same thing he discovered that the hypotheses are infinite so most people know that Chris did not live he was randomly murdered right before his 23rd birthday as he was leaving the Zen Center in San Francisco where he was learning to get his life back in order after some dark times and this afterward uh, Pierce has some beautiful philosophical wondering trying to trying to make sense of his son's death and after much reflection on this tragedy Pierce concludes that what had to be seen was that the Chris I miss so badly was not an object but a pattern and that although the pattern included the flesh and blood of Chris that was not all there was to it the pattern was larger than Chris and myself and related us in ways that neither of us understood completely and neither of us was in complete control of now Chris's body which is part of that larger pattern was gone but the larger pattern remained a huge hole had been torn out of the center of it and that was what caused all the heartache the pattern was looking for something to attach to and couldn't find anything that's probably why grieving people feel such attachment to cemetery headstones and any material property or representation of the deceased the pattern is trying to hang on to its own existence by finding some new material thing to center itself upon so you've seen this understanding of pattern and how Pirsik is characterized a church or a university the fact um, and the pattern of these institutions go on long before the building is you know uh, been demolished and the fact that the pattern of Chris goes on even when the material body of Chris is is gone um, makes a lot more sense than seeing him as an object called a person that is now gone it gives the connection of a loved person's life to ours the true meaning that, that, that it that it meant something that it continues to mean something that that pattern that pattern is always there and even beyond the person there's a meaning of relationship and and you know all the way down so Pearson's second wife was quite a bit younger than him it was not many months later that my wife conceived unexpectedly after careful discussion we decided it was not something that should continue I'm in my 50s I didn't want to go through any more child raising experiences I'd seen enough so we came to our conclusion and made the necessary medical appointment but that appointment was not to be kept I said wait stop something's wrong what it was was unknown but it was intense and I didn't want it to continue it was a really frightening thing which has since become clearer it was the larger pattern of Chris making itself known at last we reversed our decision and now realized what a catastrophe that might have been for us if we hadn't now this is really interesting because you know he's gonna just he can't deal with it and he's just gonna gonna you know uh, they're, they're gonna terminate the pregnancy that's a very similar to that right before the end of the book 
where he said, look, I can't deal with Phaedrus coming back and I'm just going to send my, I may not see my son again, but this is better for him and I'm just going to send him away. Think about how similar this is and how that transition into reality, you know, the true quality reality emerges and they, they cannot go through with this and they don't. So the middle-aged Piercig and his wife give birth to a baby girl who help fill in the cosmic and psychic hole left behind by uh, material Chris. The larger pattern that holds us all together goes on and on. In terms of this larger pattern, the lines at the end of this book still stand. We have won it. Things are better now. You can sort of tell these things. Yes, you can sort of tell these things because you know what's good. This has been demonstrated to you. You know what's quality. If you've read this book, you no longer have a doubt. And because of this book, you are free to let quality be your guide. So I hope that made sense, and I will see you in the upcoming weeks with more projects concerning the work of the great Robert Maynard Piercy.